Hello, everyone. Can you hear us okay? And we are really asking that today because I have a new computer and a new office and my microphone set up and I really don't know what it sounds like. In fact, I think I need to like hold my microphone. Can you hear me, John? Yep. Yep. Okay. Sound great. Look great. I just thought I heard an echo though. Hopefully. That's what I'm Hopefully worried that. about. Okay. Hopefully that yes. won't stay with us. Okay, let me try to put this down and hopefully I'll be able to reach my microphone too. We are so glad to be here. Thanks for allowing us a few days uh, in order for me to get home. I, after the sentencing of Lori Vallow Daybell, which we are about to talk um, a lot about tonight, aren't we, John? We laid in bed uh, yesterday <laughs> just re listening to everything. But uh, afterwards, I went to visit my brother. He's, he's doing well, and, and my mother. And, uh, and, uh, sorry about that. I had to turn off my phone there too. And we're just getting back. And so thank you for your patience. Um, I stayed a couple of days after Rexburg too, and, and we interviewed a juror, uh, named Tom. You can check that out. And we had a wonderful interview and statement by Megan Connor, Lori Vallow Daybell's cousin. And you can also see that. So, uh, Dr. John. What were your thoughts on the sentencing? Because that's pretty much what this video is about. Yeah, well, um, well, she didn't get probation, so that was good news. Um, I, don't, I don't expect that anyone expected her to be released early, and of course she wasn't. So, but, so I, I don't think there were any big surprises, multiple life sentences, consecutive, I think – more or less, that was Judge Boyce's intent from the start, no matter what she did or said. And uh, so so you don't think anything would have changed anything? I mean, I agree. I think he had made his decision as well. Well, we'll, we'll we're going to play her statement, right? So we'll, we'll dig a little deeper into the, these questions or, you know, we'll – we'll look in more detail at what she said. And I, I think every judge wants to hear a offender who's been convicted of a crime. I think almost every judge wants to hear some remorse or some accountability or culpability. And so of course, when, when you have an offender who's committed such atrocious crimes showing no remorse, it's clearly not going to help. And, it, you know, judge Boyce, when Lori was giving her statement, he was taking notes too. So he was paying close attention. I think he was looking for just a shred of remorse and he didn't find it. And of course that is not, that did not help her case. But, uh, but in the end, I, I think that, I think that the decision was already made. I agree. And I'm not surprised. It's what I, I, I don't know if I was uh, expecting three consecutive life sentences without parole. Um, Tammy Daybell, of course, that was a, a bit of a lesser conviction, not lesser, but that it was only conspiracy. She was charged with conspiracy, uh, to commit murder when it came to Tammy. Whereas with Tylee and JJ, it was first degree murder. And I know that after at the press conference, Tammy's family, her aunt Vicky thanked the judge for, for doing such a thing for Tammy, for giving for seeing how much, you know, that meant as well, that, that Tammy, Tammy's loss of life was equally as bad as JJ and Tylee's. And so I don't know um, if I expected three, but I did expect life without parole. And so um, I agree. I think it was, I think he weighed the options and I think that that was already set. I agree. Uh, but certainly watching her statement, I don't think helped uh, Judge Boyce, or maybe he had a couple of options. <laughs> you know, uh, he he mentioned her lack of remorse. How about that? Yeah. And she gave her statement in court, which is the first time we've ever heard her speak in court. She did not she did not testify at her trial, so this was the first time. She certainly did not share any remorse. Um, so I think that probably um, nailed his decision in stone before he, before he pronounced the sentence, 
there is a little bit of an echo or something going on here. I, I don't know if it's from your end. It is probably from my end. It could be that I need earphones, which I haven't set up yet. Let, let me put this okay. on mute and see. You have to talk while I'm on mute to find okay. out. <laughs> yeah. Um, that before he, before he read his sentence or gave his final sentence, he, he actually did, I think, a really excellent job of presenting the elements that would go into his decision. So in other words, he, he gave what, what I think is an excellent crash course in assessing risk in forensic cases. So what he laid out as risk factors and mitigating factors uh, is quite often what forensic psychologists will look at. So judges look at the same things. We develop reports for judges and judges are also looking at similar risk factors in terms of making decisions about release into the community. So I think it was, it, he did a really good job of kind of laying out various elements and variables that go into assessing risk. And then he put it together and, and provided, you know, he showed us how he argued uh, for his sentence based on those risk factors. So I think it was really like, you know, for me as a forensic psychologist, it was really kind of an excellent little crash course on how judges make decisions and how they assess risks and how forensic psychologists do the same. I think we did confirm it's my new computer and there's going to be a bit of an echo. So I'm going to have to keep muting myself as you speak. Next time I'm going to have to set up earphones. But we will continue on. Let's start watching the uh, statement. Does that work, John? I don't know where you want to go next or what you want to do when. So you lead me. This is your show. Okay. Well, I did. People have asked me about the diagnosis. I just want to weigh in on that really quickly. So Judge Boyce read the diagnosis, he talked about mental health as being a possible mitigating factor in terms of sentencing. So if people have certain mental health issues, then maybe in some cases that can play a role in, in a reduced sentence or a lesser sentence. And he read the diagnosis. She was diagnosed by somebody named Watson. I don't know. Uh, I presume Dr. Watson is a forensic psychologist or psychiatrist and his diagnosis. I believe that's a Dale. It's a doc. It's a Dale Watson from. Anaheim, okay. I believe the, his diagnosis was delusional disorder mixed type with bizarre content and hyper religiosity. And then he also diagnosed with continuous unspecified personality disorder with narcissistic and histrionic traits. So in terms of assessing the diagnosis, you know, I guess my first thought is obviously I, I didn't meet with Lori Daybell, so I can't really make a diagnosis. We have followed this case closely. We've observed her behavior. We've read thousands of pages of court documents. We've had access to a lot of information, but still I would not make a diagnosis. So I think my... My thoughts on the diagnosis from uh, Dr. Watson would be that I more or less agree. I would kind of agree with the delusional disorder in terms of seeing her as being delusional. Uh, and delusions are basically sort of an elaborate defense system against dealing with reality to some degree. Delusions are belief systems that are resistant to information and facts and reality. And clearly she has struggled with viewing the world realistically since we've seen her or known her and followed this case. And so one interesting component of the diagnosis is that he, he has her as mixed type, meaning that he sees, he sees Lori as having multiple delusions. Um, I, I wish that that was specified because I, you know, he, he mentions hyper-religiosity, but there are a lot of other types of delusions, grandiose delusions, persecutory delusions, somatic delusions. There's many types of delusions. So by giving her mixed type 
delusional disorder. He's basically saying that she has, you know, multiple types of delusions. It would have been interesting to know what those were. Those weren't mentioned. So as far as I can tell, I've only seen the religiosity and not the other types of delusions. But so that would have been interesting and enlightening to, to have received the other types of delusions that would have been part of the disorder. And then he gave her bizarre content and for her delusions, which was a little surprising too. So bizarre delusions are delusions where, let me give an example, you know, where like thought insertion is a bizarre delusion. So thought insertion is, for example, somebody believes that an alien aircraft is hovering over their house and aliens are inserting thoughts into someone's brain or mind. So, right. So it's bizarre in the sense that it's, it's so implausible and so unrealistic that, you know, that it is exactly as the word suggests that it's, it's, it's completely bizarre. It's completely out of the realm of the ordinary. So thought insertion, there's something called thought withdrawal, which is that somebody takes your ideas, take your thoughts. Um, you know, so to say that she has bizarre content, I think that would have been interesting too, to have known, more details, like what, what was bizarre about her delusions? Is it the fact that she believes in zombies? Is it the fact that her religi religiosity is so extreme that it crosses over into something that's implausible and bizarre? I, I don't know. I think that would have been interesting because, I mean, when you start talking about bizarre delusional content, you're starting to, in some ways, cross over into potentially – schizophrenia so more of a diagnosis of like maybe not traditional schizophrenia but schizophrenia that would be defined by delusions so so it's interesting that the, the diagnosis included those elements uh, so the diagnosis suggests that there are multiple types of delusions she's having that aren't just religious it suggests that she's having some bizarre delusional content, which could be religious, but most often bizarre delusional content is not. It's, it's the sort of content I just, just mentioned about, you know, aliens stealing our thoughts, that type of thing. Um, so I don't know that, that suggests that there might be a little more complexity to what's going on with Lori than we're seeing. I, and and I wish that, you know, maybe someday we'll have access to some of the evaluations to kind of make sense of that complexity. But I think the most important point about the diagnosis is that delusional disorder would strongly indicate that Lori believes in all the religious elements of her. I can't hear you can't hear. I can't hear you. So, okay. Have you heard anything? I apologize. It's not you. It's me. If you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Can but just you? keep talking, babe, if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. We, we can't really have a dialogue, though, if you can't hear me. Can you hear me at all? Anyway, um, so I, I was just, let me just reiterate that I, I think the most important part of, the, there's two elements of the diagnosis that I think are most critical. One is that delusional disorder suggests that she believes in this elaborate system of ideas. She believes this ideology. That's something we've really kind of struggled with from the beginning. People have asked repeatedly, does she believe this or is, just, is this just, a basically a large elaborate ruse to evade responsibility for her behavior and to commit crimes that would justify her obtaining money or engaging in a, a extramarital affair with Chad. So uh, this question of belief has always been a really big one. I have personally said since we've been on this case that I, I really felt like she did believe it. And so here you have, Dr. Watson, who spent way more time with her than I have, obviously, uh, diagnosing her with delusional disorder and saying essentially that, yeah, she believes this. 
this stuff is real to her. It's tangible. She believes it to the core of her being and she lives it. And so um, that's part of the reason, obviously, that some of these crimes occurred. The other component of the diagnosis that I think is worth talking about is the personality disorder component. He gives her unspecified personality disorder, meaning that he doesn't land on any specific personality disorder and attribute that to her, but he sees her as having a broad personality disorder with certain features, which in this case, he says are narcissistic and histrionic. I'll be uh, honest, I didn't like that he didn't diagnose. I thought, why, why are you, why, why are you, isn't that like the point? I, I wanted to ask you that. Isn't that the point? Yeah. Like, I mean, a, a personality disorder or disorders? Well, I, I think it's non-committal. I think it's a little bit of a cop out, you know, but, but I mean, the, the reason, maybe the reason he's not diagnosing is because he doesn't have enough information or uh, I, maybe he, he, maybe he performed testing, but not sufficient testing to really land on a specific diagnosis for a personality disorder. I think it's, it's been fairly clear to us from the start that there's some type of personality disorder here uh, as as someone who's spoken extensively to Colby, who, from what I understand, the last time I talked to Colby, he said he has not talked to a lot of these evaluators, uh, which to me would pose some serious issues because if I was going to perform an evaluation on someone like Lori, I would want access to as many family members and relatives as possible to get different perspectives. I would especially want Colby to weigh in. And Colby... Colby really provided a lot of information to me. And again, I haven't met Lori, but that, that indicated there might be, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm not diagnosing here, but that there did seem to be some borderline features. And so, um, so I, I don't, you know, borderline <laughs> features. And, and I want to say you went off of some, uh, discovery between the, uh, Joe Ryan and Lori Vallow Daybell custody battle where yeah. uh, there was an interview with someone where they suggested, I believe it was Vivian, that uh, someone ought to try to see if perhaps she has borderline. So we went right. with that. There was, there was somebody who suggested that she had features of borderline personality disorder and histrionic disorder, but in talking to Colby and talking to people that knew her quite well, and then just kind of observing her behaviors, she tends to be pretty inconsistent in a lot of her behaviors. She tends to be a little bit, her emotion, emotionally, she tends to be, be a little bit labile. I mean, she's up and down quite a bit. She has, I think, a poorly defined sense of self, self so she has kind of an unstable sense of self. That might indicate some borderline features, but um, and, and in discussing some issues with Colby, you know, he he had the same sense or he indicated that her, that he believed his mother had similar qualities. But but again, I don't is that sufficient to diagnose it? No, it wouldn't be. But. You know, I so <clears throat> I don't disagree with this diagnosis, but I think it's a bit of a cop out in the sense that it's unspecified. You're not, he's not nailing down specific personality disorders. He's just saying she has narcissistic features, histrionic features. And honestly, I think, I think any of the personality disorders in that cluster, which is cluster B could apply to Lori. So, so, uh, I, I don't know. I, could she have a couple? Could she have a couple of personality disorders? Yeah, she can, you can have, you can diagnose as many personality disorders as you think are relevant, you know, like Dahmer had, Dahmer had like four personality disorders that were all diagnosed. So you're not limited to one. Um, there's, there's a lot of overlap among the personality disorders. So sometimes that becomes a little confusing. So most of her disorders fall into cluster B, which, which are all, you know, which are all fairly similar. You know, there's, there's also a big question here about antisocial. So, I mean, technically, because she has no criminality when she's a teenager or before the age of 18, I guess you wouldn't really apply it. But but 
we do know that she has some potential history of poisoning people. And so there's, there's, there's always this question about undetected criminality, right? That people can have criminal past, they just weren't caught and they didn't get convicted. So there's, let me make a distinction here. So that's important if you're doing a risk assessment because you can't, when somebody has committed crimes and they're not convicted or caught, you can't factor that into risk. However, if somebody tells you they've committed crimes and they haven't been caught or it's been undetected, you can factor that into diagnoses or you can factor that into other elements of the, of an evaluation. So if I'm doing, or if I'm assessing someone and I'm, I'm, looking at a risk assessment instrument, like say the static 99 or something. Um, I can't, I can only count crimes in which there's convictions, but that doesn't mean that I can't use that information in other ways that would be applicable to the evaluation. And that, so that, that brings me to this issue of, I, I I don't know that she would qualify for antisocial personality disorder, but uh, I do think potentially knowing what we know about some of her history that there's certainly some antisocial tendencies or traits going on here. Crystal's asking if she didn't participate in the pre-sentencing report, the PS, um, could that be why there's no diagnosis? Not necessarily. Right. Or. Yeah. I, so you're right. I think the, so the, the the information we're talking about now occurred prior to the PSI. So the pre-sentence investigation report occurs after conviction prior to sentencing. So it's pre-sentencing, but after conviction. So the most of the psychological evaluations that we know of were conducted well before the trial, for example. So my understanding is that she did participate in some of the pre-trial evaluations, mm -hmm. especially ones where the defense hired people to conduct evaluations. Um, but what's interesting there too is that there have been multiple diagnoses. So this is this is one person's diagnosis, diagnoses. There are other diagnoses that differ substantially from this. When she was when she was deemed to be incompetent. I believe she was diagnosed, and we haven't confirmed this, but we've heard through the grapevine that she was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. So that's quite different. And, and actually, if you diagnose someone with schizoaffective disorder, you can't really diagnose them with delusional disorder. So one of the, one of the differential diagnoses for delusional disorder is that someone cannot have symptoms of schizophrenia. And schizoaffective disorder suggests that someone has had symptoms of schizophrenia. So actually that would that's be, confusing. That's that would confusing. Be confusing. Right. That that's a contraindication to a diagnosis of delusional disorder. So let's, let's say hypothetically that she was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. And let's say that was accurate. It's unlikely that you could then six months later back out of that diagnosis. You could back out of it because she could, no longer have those symptoms as severely if she's on medication. What you couldn't do, however, is if, if somebody has active, has had active symptoms of schizophrenia, those are what we call, um, they're, the, they're the, there's five active symptoms of schizophrenia. Those are called the A symptoms of schizophrenia or the active symptoms of schizophrenia. If you have those or have had those, then it's much less likely that you're going to be diagnosed with delusional disorder. So there is a bit of a contradiction here. And also it's important to keep in mind that delusions are also one of the five active symptoms of schizophrenia. Hmm. Right? So if somebody has delusions, that does not necessarily rule out schizophrenia. So I, I know okay. this, is, I don't, this is going to get a little comp. I'm not trying to get this too complex, but my point no, is. No, it's I interesting. That, it's interesting. Yeah. She was originally diagnosed. One of her first diagnoses was schizoaffective disorder. Right. Uh, with this new diagnosis, and Judge Boyce did explain that he said the most recent diagnosis. He he right. chose what to go with. Um, would mean that she does 
does not have schizoaffective disorder. If she has delusional disorder, she does not have schizoaffective. Right. Again, if, if you're diagnosing someone with delusional disorder, one of the differentials or one of the ways you distinguish that disorder from schizophrenia is by the fact that someone cannot have those active symptoms of schizophrenia. And so, but either way, I think either way, I, I would have to say that she does seem to believe this stuff. Like one of the things that seems reasonably consistent is that people, people, people's diagnosis, mental health professionals diagnoses seem to indicate that Lori believes this stuff. She's all in on it. She, she lives it. She acts it right. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, some people are asking questions like this and I realize it's important. They're asking what antisocial means. And that's actually important to clarify because when we're younger and we say, I'm feeling antisocial, we think we're staying home from a party. You know, I'm, I'm staying inside. I'm feeling antisocial. That's not what it means. Do you want to just quickly explain that too? And I, and I so right. So, and I, and I social, so I'm meaning it more in a, I'm using it more in a clinical sense. And I social means that a tendency to violate some of the norms and rules of society, a tendency to, to, okay. So here's an example. When judge Boyce says that she doesn't participate in any of the PSI evaluations, there's an expectation there that she is going to, she's going to agree to the court's requests, right? Like it's normal for an inmate or an offender to undergo this process prior to sentencing. It's expected. It's a part of the, the, the normal rules of the court are that you participate in a, P, a pre-sentence investigation and that they generate a report, report about risk. So by refusing to do that, in some ways she's violating the norms of the court. She's, she's rebelling, let's say. She's, she's being antisocial in the sense that she's not agreeing to some of the dictates of the court some of the expectations of the court and probably some of the rules that I don't know, 90 plus percent of offenders or defendants typically follow. So, you know, an example would be when I'm doing an evaluation with someone occasionally with an, with a offender, occasionally I'll get someone who absolutely refuses to engage in testing. Or actually, at the start of an interview, they'll say, I'm not going to talk to you. I refuse to talk to you. And, you know, the the question to me is in that circumstance. So I try to explain to them that I'm I'm there on behalf. I'm, I'm an objective party, that I'm there because the state requires an objective evaluation by a third party that's not a part of the state, that doesn't work for the state. I don't work for attorneys that my job is to try to be as objective as possible. My goal is to really understand them. It's to understand their life. It's to look at risk factors and it's to come up with something that's as, you know, neutral and objective as possible about recommendations and risk. Mm -hmm. And so once I explain that process to them, most people will most people will continue with the interview and they'll agree to go forward and they'll engage in testing and they'll, they'll kind of put forth what I would call a good faith effort to provide an accurate depiction of who they are. But some people who have problems with authority, for example, and have histories of histories of rule breaking and criminality will not engage in that process because they see me as an authority figure. They see me as an extension of the court. They're angry. They think they've been railroaded. They think they're victims, right? And so just by refusing to participate in that process in some ways is an antisocial act. Right. 
Right. So, and we've um, talked a lot about this, guys. In, in our original podcast series from 2020, Beyond the Veil, we discuss a lot about Lori's beliefs and possible um, antisocial traits and, and other things. Um, yeah. Thank you, babe. Um, yeah, I mean, we could keep going. There are so many questions here. Should we first okay. go through her yeah. statement and then maybe ask some questions at the end? Or how do you want to do this? Perhaps it's time to to go over her statement. Yeah, let's go over her statement. I don't, I don't want to get bogged down. I think the diagnosis part's important, but I don't want to really get bogged down too much in that. I think the important point there is, number one, that delusional disorder would indicate that she really believes this stuff. And number two, she has a personality disorder, although it's not crystal clear what that is. I think by saying it's unspecified, I think the door is sort of open to what it actually is. Or, or that it could be, be multiple. Or it could yeah, be it could multiple. be multiple. It, it may be more than narcissistic and histrionic. I think there's some confusion there, but those are the two important elements of diagnosis. Yes, she does have a personality disorder or disorders, and right. people are trying to process her belief, her beliefs, whether it's delusions or, yeah, delusional. She has delusions. Maybe she believes in something. Religiosity. I don't know. <laughs> the, well, yeah, so the according to the diagnosis here from Dr. Watson, the the delusions are primarily what he calls hyper religiosity meaning extreme religious beliefs and although there you know again this isn't crystal clear because he says it's mixed type mixed type of delusions means more than one type of delusion so i right i don't without seeing the report i i don't know what other delusions he's referring to but at the very least religious delusions Religious delusions. Yeah. And, and let me just show you too. I wasn't going to show you guys this, but I just happened to have them sitting here. I was looking at them earlier today. So I'll just show you. Sorry, crash bang as I like pick these up from under an old laptop. But these, these were some of the things she was studying and like-minded people with her belief systems. So Jason Mao, Thor, Lori Vallow, um, all those people that came up in court, Melanie Gibb. Dreams and visions of the last days by, oh, we, we can't get it. Uh, by Roger K. Young. And then this is actually from a preparing a people uh, workshop, dreams and visions workbook. You open it up and you have all these things to fill out in order to like, you know, be better with your dreams and visions and how dreams are visions and visions are dreams. So uh, throw it. I just want to say like throw in somebody like Lori Vallow Daybell and her diagnosis and give her this workbook and then see what happens, you know? It's, yeah, it's hard. You, I think you I know. I'm trying. Out. I'm trying. There? There. There it there. is. Yeah. So. That's the stuff she was studying along with Chad. So that's certainly not helpful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's, should we go over her statement? Bit so I, just a quick comment. So I, I noticed that Ozzy Tad mentioned that they moved, they, they ruled out schizoaffective disorder when she didn't respond to medication. And that could be the case. I don't, we don't have that information. So it's quite possible that they diagnosed her with some version of schizophrenia early on. <clears throat> they tried antipsychotics or some antipsychotic psychotic cocktail, including antidepressants, and she simply didn't respond. So that would definitely lead one to think that perhaps she doesn't have schizophrenia, although some people don't respond to antipsychotics. So I, I, I don't, but we don't know for sure if that's, we don't have that information. So we can't really assess that that's how they arrived at delusional disorder. Yes. Um, and then, and we, so before we get started on the statement, um, no, I can't remember what I was going to say, but uh, well, let's let's go ahead with this. I uh, yeah, let's start. It's a nine-minute statement. Shall we do that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. 
And then I think we have to don't mute yourself quite yet because if we, well, no, you're gonna have to mute yourself. And then John, when you want me to stop, just wave at me. I'll be watching you. Okay. okay. Because we need to both mute ourselves. Okay. Can you go ahead and mute you. All right. Very well. You may make your statement. I would like to start by quoting John from the New Testament in the Bible. In John chapter 8, verse 7, Jesus says, He that is without sin among you, let him cast first cast a stone at her. Then in first, verse 15, Jesus says, Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. Jesus knows me. And Jesus understands me. I mourn with all of you who mourn my children and Tammy. Jesus Christ knows the truth of what happened here. Jesus Christ knows that no one. Okay. So can you, are you back? Yeah, we're waiting for you. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I don't think it's unexpected that she would start by quoting from the New Testament, by the way. So that's very consistent with who she is and this delusional belief system we just talked about. But I think what, what's a little unusual here is that she is sort of placing blame elsewhere, that she's, right? It, it's a little peculiar to come out of the gate and to blame others for judging her and to say that we're all sinners, so we're kind of all in this together and we're all to blame. I think that's it's probably not what the judge wants to hear <laughs> with, your, with your opening statement. She, I think what's also interesting is that she's beginning to kind of cast herself in the victim role. She's saying that Jesus Christ knows the truth of what happened here, that many other people don't. And she's asking everyone, she's saying that uh, she mourns with all of you who mourn my children. So... You know, she's she's trying kind of trying to to lump the listeners together with her. She's trying to kind of normalize her crimes here. She's trying to play the victim a little bit, but she's also blaming. You know, and and I've mentioned this before, but you know, one of the major elements of personality disorder is someone who blames other people for everything. So, I think to to come out of the gate blaming and saying that you know how dare you for judging me you guys are all sinners too we should all mourn my children together you know it's it's pretty bold it's pretty it's pretty peculiar pity play in other words uh that is true w one major thing you look for if you're trying to figure out if someone might have a personality disorder if you're trying to figure out who they are, uh, how often they paint themselves in the victim role, right? Like the right, absolutely. Play. I mean, so think about if you think about being a playing the victim role and personality disorders, it makes sense, right? Because if you're always the victim, that means that you're not looking at yourself, you're not looking at your behaviors, and you're not learning. So being a victim is the opposite of being resilient. When you're resilient you have enough fortitude and stamina to understand that you make mistakes, that you learn from those mistakes, that you adapt to those mistakes. And when you're a victim perpetually, you don't make mistakes, you don't learn from those mistakes, and you have no resilience. So personality disorders lack resiliency. <clears throat> Excuse me, personality disorders lack resiliency. And that that's what makes them personality disorders. They're ingrained habitual patterns of reacting to certain things in the environment. Interesting. Yeah, right. So the pity play right away. 
Lori is always pity play, victim. blaming victim. All you know, th- these are gonna these have been themes in her life. Um, they will continue here, obviously. So you can even the religion, even keep- the religiosity. Right, I'll keep going. Jesus Christ knows that no one was murdered in this case. Accidental deaths happen. Suicides happen. Fatal side effects from medications happen. I have a different perspective. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, this is... (laughs) This is just a a jaw-dropping moment for me. So she's now providing us with an explanation for the cause of of the deaths of the various players that she's been accused of murdering or has murdered, according to a jury. But So she's saying that the deaths were either accidental, suicides, or fatal side effects from medication. So she's, she's actually denying that any murders occurred. I mean, this is... I don't even, you know, I think when you think about this case, um, it's not particularly surprising. I, I think that she's, I think we kind of, as those of us who know Lori know that she's kind of incapable of accepting the facts or the truth of the matter here. I, don't, I think this is someone who clearly would find it way too painful and distressing to acknowledge that she played a role in the deaths of her children, that she murdered her children and, and or Tammy. And so this is her explanation. You know, the, the problem, the problem with this, ex, there's so many problems with this explanation, obviously, that I, I don't even know where to start, but um, you know, the, the first question, I mean, <laughs> Obviously, the jury has litigated this and found her guilty. But if we look at if we just look at these explanations, they're clearly absurd. I mean, first of all, if somebody has an accidental death or tries to commit suicide or has fatal side effects from medication, the first thing you're going to do is call 911 and try to get help for someone. So why didn't they call 911? Why didn't she call 911 and seek help? Right. In any of those instances she mentions, the obvious response, the humane, compassionate response is to get help, to seek help. There was no help seeking here, right? Obviously. Also, given that, right, that we know that there were cover ups. And we know that she, right, that, that, that we know that she provided different explanations for these crimes previously. So she's. Her she, children were missing because of a custody battle originally between her and Kay Woodcock. Well, so that, that, right. That, that, was her sure initial, not this. that was her initial explanation. You're right. The kids are safe because uh, I'm just hiding them from Kay Woodcock. Clearly this is changing now. Right. Right. I mean, so that, that, you know, if, if, if these were accidental, then why would you, why would you try to hide the bodies? Why would you disfigure the bodies? Why? Right. I don't, I mean, it, it it's, it's so absurd. That- and everything, and everything we heard in trial, she heard, she was there every day. She was listening every day, even the day she wanted to get out of, the trial, she was there. So we saw all of the evidence and the testimonies in trial, as did Lori. I would typically say to a friend, you're delusional. (laughs) Right. And and so this is, this is going to become a theme throughout her statement, which is, I really think she's trying to assuage her guilt. She's really, uh, you know, it, it would be a big question about whether she does feel guilt we, we know she doesn't feel remorse. Correct. But in terms of guilt, um, I don't know. It seems like she knows what happened here. 
I think she's trying to appease her guild a little bit, and this is the beginning of that. But the absurdity, this explanation is so ridiculous that you just have to scratch your head, I think. And so um, the thing, what she's not saying here is that everybody who was designated to be a zombie ended up dead or almost dead. So uh, Brandon Boudreau would be the exception. He, you know, he survived because the bullet missed him, but almost everybody that they designated as dark or a zombie was murdered. And so that is in no way accidental. So anyway, this is, you know, this is, you've got some real mental gymnastics going on here. There's a question there. Is there a difference between guilt and remorse? Yeah. Uh, remorse, remorse would mean that she would have to acknowledge the, the crimes and her behaviors and her participation in the murders. I think guilt is, is more circumscribed. Guilt is more about behavior, specific behaviors. Um, I think she's, she, it's, she seems to be struggling a little bit with guilt here. Um, and, but you know, she she does a good job of, of rationalizing what happened. And, and so in that sense, she's able to purge herself of any guilt, I think. Avoid all guilt. Should I keep going? Yep, keep going. Perspective in life. Because in 2002, when I was pregnant with Tylee, I died in the hospital while in labor with her. They tried to stop my labor. They put me on the table and they put something in my IV and I felt my spirit falling to the floor. I was standing near my pregnant body, watching the doctors try to revive me, which took them a few minutes. In that time, my sister Stacy was standing to my left. I turned to hug her and was surprised that her spirit was as tangible as a physical body because I knew I was in spirit and she was in spirit. She said she needed to show me some things and we went to heaven. I later returned to my body. Because of this experience, I have access to heaven and the spirit world. Since then, I have had many communications from people now living in heaven, including my children, Tylee Ashland and Joshua Jackson, my sisters, Stacy and Lolly, my aunts and my uncles and my grandparents. I have had many communications with Jesus Christ, the savior of this world and our heavenly parents. I've had many angelic visitors have come and communicated with me and even manifested themselves to me. Because of these communications, I know for a fact that my children are happy and busy in the spirit world. Because of my communications with my friend, Tammy Day. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So until this moment in court, I, I wasn't aware that Lori had a near-death experience. And apparently, according to Summer, her sister, Summer wasn't aware either, right? So correct in summer in summer's interview with Nate Eaton after the uh the sentencing she said she had never heard this and then according to Megan Connor on our channel she says she's never heard this and then according to Adam and Rex although Adam got it wrong he said it was Colby she mentioned it's not it's Tylee um he's never heard this near death experience either um, although I will say, I believe the defense did hear it before this day. I, I do believe that she has told this story before this day, but um, okay, yeah. And, and well, I want to say it. this too. There, there are some unique things in about, um, was it 2007? She did state that she believed Tylee Ryan was the reincarnated version of her sister, Stacy. So there are a few parallels, 
Julie Rowe believes that she stole this near-death experience story from her. Uh, I have listened to a very similar story in Visions of Glory by John Pontius or Tom Harrison, who states that his first near-death experience is when he was born, uh, being born. So I just want to throw all those out there. Those are all the things people have been speculating about. But uh, go ahead, John. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, this is, this is again, this is another jaw-dropping moment for a lot of reasons. But it, it's not unexpected in terms of this entire Daybell narrative because the near-death experience or the NDE, whatever, however we want to refer to it, is what gives is essentially what gives Chad or gave Chad his powers. By Chad arguing or saying or stating that he had near-death experiences, that gave him the authority essentially to see beyond the veil. And seeing beyond the veil means that you're seeing the future and you have access to, as Lori points out here, seeing beyond the veil means you have access to the future, you have access to heaven, you have access to all these deceased people. And it, so having a near-death experience in this community or cult or whatever we want to refer to it is, is really critical in the sense that it gives people the authority to claim the ability to become prophets. So in other words, a near-death experience to this group is essentially the same as prophecy. Or visionary. How about a visionary? Yeah. Okay, visionary. Right. For Prophetic Chad, I think it, yeah. For Chad, it was about it gave it but his his near death experiences gave him the capacity to become a deity of sorts. For Lori, I think she needs this. She needs to claim this because it allows her access to all the deceased people that she's gonna talk about in her statement. Right. Again, so it becomes this it becomes this um it becomes this this it's about authority it becomes about an ability to claim that you have special powers that you have access to heaven and that you have this ability to do what the normal a normal person can't do as i said with chad if you take away the near death experiences with chad he's just a normal guy he's just an average joe He's just an average guy that goes to church, that has a family, right? But when you have near-death experiences, when you add those in with Chad, now he's special. Now he has the gift of prophecy. And I think with Lori, this near-death experience scenario here, it allows her to justify her delusions, number one. It also contributes to her delusions. I think it solidifies her delusions, right? It, it makes everything worse, but of course, it's not unexpected that she would claim she had this because now she can communicate with all the deceased people she's going to talk about. Yeah, it, uh, it is interesting, this near-death experience thing that this group does need in order to have a power. And here she is saying she has it. I also want to point out, she just listed all of the people that are dead in her life. She referred to two sisters, Stacy and Lolly. Lolly is Lolly's name has been referred to as Laura and Laura Lee, uh, but she was uh, just weeks old when she allegedly died of a uh, heart, um, something to do with the heart that was unknown as an infant. And then she mentioned cousins and other people that went before her. She did not mention her brother Alex, and I find that really interesting too. I, I don't know what you make of that, John, but it makes me wonder if in some ways they still want to blame him or, or what that is, but she did not make reference to her brother, Alex, uh, going before her. I think that's really interesting to me of all the people that are dead, not Alex. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, right. I don't, yeah. It's, it's a little peculiar. I think, We'll talk about that a little bit further down the road, but we might need to jump ahead a little here That's just because she's, she's going to be a little redundant. Um, do you okay, well, we can just keep listening. Let's listen to the okay. whole thing. Let's just start. We'll just keep, I'll just okay. keep going. Are happy and busy in the spirit world. Because of my communications with my friend, Tammy Daybell, 
I know that she is also very happy and extremely busy. I have always mourned the loss of my loved ones and I have lost many in this mortal world. However, I know them more than most people. I know where they are now and what they're doing. I know how wonderful heaven is and I'm homesick for it every single day. I know we all lived in heaven before we were born on earth and we were all adult spirits in the heavenly realm. We chose to come to earth as mortals. Heaven is more wonderful than you can possibly imagine. I do not fear death, but I look forward to it. I, do not, I did not want to return to my body when I was out of it. Even though my son Colby, who I adored more than anything, was only six years old at the time, and I was about to give birth to this new baby girl that I wanted so badly. I was a young mother, and you would think I wouldn't want to leave my children, but as I stood in heaven, I did not want to go back. I thought they would be fine without me because I was peaceful and I was happy and I was home. But then I was told by Jesus that I needed to go back and complete things that I had covenanted or promised to do before I was born. This caused me a lot of distress because I knew heaven was my real home and I only wanted to be there. I was free from pain, emotional and physical. But then I was shown how I would help my children and others in the future. So ultimately I did agree to go back to my body. Kylie has visited me. She is happy and very busy. Tylee is free now from all the pains of her life. Tylee suffered horrible physical pain her whole life. I am here, by the way, I had to turn off the camera for a bit, but go ahead, John. You're on mute. You're on mute, John. Okay, got it. Sorry. Okay. Um, so a couple of thoughts on on that little part. That I, it's interesting to me that she sees home as being elsewhere. She sees home as being heaven, or as she'll talk about later, the New Jerusalem that's to come. And I, so I think what's interesting to me here is that in many ways. Home is a fictitious place for Lori. Home is something that she's created and it's become a part of her delusion. I think that's part of the problem for Lori is that she doesn't see home as something physical and real in this world. She sees it as being elsewhere. And so I think in that sense, it's much easier for her to justify her behaviors or murders in this case. Also, this, this idea that um, she was shown how she would help her children and others in the future, right? Like the irony of that, that she came back to help her children and then she murdered them, right? <laughs> like, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a right. moment of absolute, um, I don't know, you know, blindness, right? That's, that's a moment of of insanity like she's saying she's coming back for her kids and the end result of that is she ends up murdering her kids and she doesn't see that as being ironic or problematic she's she says that to the world in her statement like what tina said here had an nde in childbirth oh i just lost it hold on where'd it go had an nde in childbirth uh, Big J told me to get my soul back into my body to take care of my kid. So I guess I came back, you know? Yeah. Right. Came back to harm them. I mean, right. Like you can't. I know. I know. And she wanted to stay, but somebody else, I also find it interesting that to me, it's also showing a lack of conscience. If, if that happened to me, which it, it wouldn't, but if I decided that that happened to me 
And I said, I would have said I wanted to go back because I was worried about my child. I had a child. I wanted to be with him. She's putting that on big J or Jesus. I didn't want to go back. Jesus told me I should go back. You know, there's always this outer voice, even with Chad, there's always this outer voice telling him what to do with Lori. There's always this outer voice telling her what to do. Where's their conscience? Where's their, where's their heart and their emotions and their feelings. It's always about what somebody else is telling them to do. I find that's interesting too. Right. Her, her sense of morality and her conscience is very much external or tends to be external to her. Again, this idea that she can't see or envision a home that's based here in this world on earth. She can't put that together. She has to see home as being essentially a fictitious construct that becomes a part of her delusions. And I, I think that's a big problem. You know, when you see home, when you're enticed by an afterlife and you see home, you see that home as being more realistic and more inviting than your actual home here, that's, that's a setup for real problems down the road. Clearly. <laughs> and were there ever problems? All right. Should I keep going? Yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. No, go ahead. What? I'm, I'm trying to, we might be at a spot where I want you to, to stop very quickly, but yeah, keep going. Okay. I'll, I'll go back a bit. Cause I, I couldn't get it to stop right away. So here, let's see. Pains of her life. Tylee suffered horrible physical pain her whole life. I sat with Tylee in the hospital year after year, year after, year, after year, year while she screamed in pain when the morphine wasn't even enough to take away the pain of her pancreatitis. I sat there while she cried and I held back her hair while she threw up. And I am the only person on this earth who knows how much Tylee suffered in her life. She had pain. Your microphone's she echoing, never, Lauren. She never felt good. Her body did not work right. And I don't know if that was from complications from me dying while she was being born or something else, but she had a very difficult life. She was sexually abused by her own biological father since she was three years old. And she was forced by family court to go visit him for 10 years against her will. I fought for her in court. I protected her. I tried to protect her with my whole life, I tried to protect her. I worried about her every single day. Tylee had to get her GED because she couldn't go to school every day because she never felt good. She felt sick. Nobody knows this because Tylee, like myself, tries to put on a good front, tries to be a happy person, tries to have hope in life, tries to know that she's here for a purpose and that she has an eternal purpose to be on this earth but I never stopped worrying about her. One of the times that Tylee came to me as a spirit after she died, she said, she commanded me and she said to me, stop worrying, mom, we are fine. She knows how I worry. And Sorry about the echo there earlier, fixed it. Thanks, babe. So uh, just, just to summarize, I don't know. Can other people hear? I can hear that echo on your end. Can other people hear that? Just to summarize some of the, some of her statements about Tylee here. It's interesting to think that perhaps we've, we've talked about, the possibility of Munchausen's by proxy syndrome and Tylee, given Lori's propensity to poison people. People are saying they can hear an echo. I cannot hear an echo oh. and I'm on mute. I'm okay, on mute so and I cannot hear an echo. So I don't know what it would be. It's just me. Um, okay. That's fine. I, I can live with it if you want to. If they can't hear it, then it's fine. So 
I was just going to say that she's attributing all this suffering to Tylee, but I, I think it's highly possible that Lori contributed to some of that suffering. That if, if as we've speculated, and I don't know if this is true, but Lori does have this propensity to poison people. It does seem like a lot of Tylee's hospital visits were unexplained. The pancreatitis wasn't the only diagnosis. And it does open the door. It does raise the question about whether there was factitious disorder imposed upon another, which is we used to be called Munchausen's by proxy. But um, but again, there's this there's this contradiction. There's this lack of insight. There's this blindness about what's going on in the sense that it's quite possible that Lori was the cause of a lot of her physical suffering. It wasn't just pancreatitis. It was pancreatitis caused by some other agent that we don't know about. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm speculating here, but but it certainly would be if we're talking about playing the victim and presenting herself as kind of a martyr, right, and a loving mother, and that would all go along and being attention seeking. That would all go along with this possibility that Lori may have created some of Tylene's suffering. So here she is talking about that suffering and using it as a justification for murder when in fact she may have very well contributed to some of that suffering or maybe a lot of that suffering. So here you have Lori playing the victim, portraying herself as this loving mother who's doing everything for her child. And in fact, it's quite possible that she may have been one of the major contributors to a great deal of Tylee's suffering. So, so, you know, this is, Potentially for me, this is a very disturbing portion of the statement. I guess all of it's disturbing, but but um, especially this last line about she commanded her to stop worrying. And again, if, if we're talking about trying to appease her guilt, I mean, so here she is. She's, she's seen Tylee or whatever it is. She's having this delusion or this vision of Tylee visiting her and saying, Mom, stop worrying. You know, yeah, I know you murdered me. You know, you may have poisoned me for a little bit. So I went to the hospital so you could get attention from doctors and, you know, but don't worry about it. I'm good. Stop worrying, mom. And by the way, mom, don't feel any guilt because, yeah, you murdered me. So, um, you know, I, this is this is pretty out there. This one uh, really upsets me, too, for the reasons you mentioned, but also um, it goes along with factitious disorder in the sense that that's often because they want to see what a great person they are. They want attention. Look at me. I'm such a good mother. Look at this. She's not sharing the story to say, don't doesn't everybody feel bad for Tylee? My right. poor daughter. This is so sad for Tylee. No, she's telling this story and then saying, I did this for her. I held her hair back when she threw up. I was there in the hospital. This has nothing to do about Tylee. This has to do with her and how great of a mother she is and how right. great of a person she is. She's not saying, can you imagine, you know, the pain and, and I feel so bad for her and she went through so much and my heart breaks for her. No, it's look what I did. This is not the first time she's given this speech either. We heard this same we heard this same speech when she was with Colby in a in a in the jailhouse call that was played during the trial with Colby, her son. She said, "You weren't there." She she got defensive with Colby and then said, "I was in the hospital with Tylee. I did this with Tylee. I've taken care of Tylee." As in, don't blame me. I'm a good mother. It doesn't matter that she's dead and in somebody's yard and she's mutilated. I was with her in the hospital. So it absolutely goes to this idea that um, I look at me, look at how great I am. To me, it almost confirms what you and I have always said about this. And, and by the way, for those that are interested in this, in all of the evidence we have of, of the possibility of factitious disorder, you can go to our YouTube video or our podcast, The Secrets of Lori Vallow Daybell part two. That's when we discussed this in detail. It was done before the trial. Um, but that's the, this is a very important part of this speech. Me, me, 
me and I'm wonderful. So it doesn't really matter what happened to her. I was, I was wonderful before. Yeah. And, and what you just said is completely consistent with someone who would have Munchausen's by proxy in the sense that Correct. children are seen as objects. Children are dehumanized. Psychologists sometimes say that the children become like fetishes, that they're treated like objects for the mother's glorification and attention seeking. And if, if in fact she does have history, if the diagnosis we heard earlier about histrionic would be very consistent with a factitious disorder imposed upon another. Correct. Should I keep going? Yep. Let's keep going. Oh, one, one other thing I want to mention with this, um, it was Vicki Hoban who Tammy's Tammy Daybell's aunt who gave a victim impact statement who shared that when her granddaughter, who was Tylee Ryan's good friend, what a coincidence, um, when her granddaughter wanted Tylee to come hang out, uh, it wasn't that Tylee would say, I'm so sick. I just can't, I'm in so much pain. She would actually say, oh, I can't come. My mom is telling me that I'm too sick. My mom is saying, I can't go out. I'm too sick. That was shared on our interview with Vicki Hoban. That is an also important factor in this. It's not Tylee saying, I'm so sick. It's Lori telling Tylee she's too sick. So one other piece of evidence. Mom, we are fine. She knows how I worry and how I miss her. The first time JJ visited me after he passed away, he put his arm around me and he said to me, you didn't do anything wrong, mom. I love you. And I know you loved me every minute of my life. JJ, JJ Joshua Jackson was an adult spirit. And he was very, very tall when he put his arm around me. He is busy. He is engaged. He has jobs that he does there. And he is happy where he is. His life was short, but JJ's life was meaningful. JJ was a wonderful person and touched the lives of everyone. And I adored him every minute of his life. My eternal friend, Tammy Daybell, has visited me on several occasions. She came to bring me peace and comfort, and I know that she is extremely busy helping her family, especially her children and grandchildren, and I have a great love for Tammy. My beautiful children, Tylee Ashland and Joshua Jackson, Rest safely this day in the arms of Jesus. My wonderful friend, Tammy Daybell, rest safely this day in the arms of Jesus. And I look forward to the day when we are all reunited and I too will rest with them in the arms of my Jesus. All right, Ms. Fellow, thank you for your comments to the court. I love watching Judge Boyce's face too during that time a few times when when he's saying there uh, my my eternal when she's saying my eternal friend Tammy Daybell he gives her like the side eye like you, you really go in there um, Judge Boyce does a really good job staying straight faced but there are a few times where I see it in his eyes <laughs> like <laughs> this is this is the direction she's going huh um, I want to point out too, you know, referring to Tammy Daybell is so, as a friend, I've, and I've said this over and over again, is so offensive. But I also want to point out that when she says her eternal friend, I think that she's referring to some eternal bond she will have with her because she is married to Chad Daybell. And Tammy is also married to Tab, Tammy Daybell. Um, but I'll let you have the psychology behind this, John. You're still on mute. So take it away. Okay. Can you hear me? 
Okay. So I think this last part just reiterates some of the themes we've heard earlier. Again, notice that JJ is coming to her and saying that she didn't do anything wrong. That's about appeasing her guilt. That JJ is telling her that that she loved him. So in other words, it's it's about her and it's not about JJ. It's about how JJ knows that she loved him rather than her loving JJ. And so again, that's extraordinarily narcissistic. It becomes about her guilt, her perceptions of herself as a mother, and presumably her trying to really kind of appease her guilt around the fact that she murdered her kids. Yeah, very narcissistic. Um, and also referring to Tammy, you know, she was the mistress. She was having an open affair with Chad while Tammy was alive. She was a mistress and she's referring to Tammy as a best friend. Just so many things, right? And that's also appeasing her guilt, right? Like JJ said, I know you love me. I love, you know, um, and then Tammy Daybell's her eternal friend giving her comfort. It, it is so, so self-centered. It's kind of mind blowing. Um, Somebody just said friends don't murder friends, at, le at least not friends that you want. So, yeah, not, yeah, not that, friends, right, you, and that's the extreme. Friends don't cheat on with your husband either, and then murder you. Yeah, and I'll, and I want to point out too some. This isn't the psychology, John. You're covering the psychology, but uh, when it refers to JJ as an adult and tall, again, that's another visions of glory element. I'm going to be discussing visions of glory uh, in more depth. I actually believe on Mormon story soon with Megan Connor, but visions of glory was this book that Lori Daybell was reading at the pool when, uh, Hawaii police brought her, um, the, the papers demanding that she produce her children. Uh, it's something she and Chad would read all the time. Chad discussed this book in his speeches, but in that book, everybody is an adult spirit. Uh, there are no children, children grow up and then everyone reaches about the age of mid thirties and everybody stops. So that's how she's envisioning JJ, you know, just right. And everybody's reassuring her. She's never reassuring anyone else. You know, she's just, everybody's just letting her know that she's wonderful and that she's okay. You know, the, that brings me a question, you know, John, when I was with Megan Connor, well, finish and then I'll ask you questions. What, what else do you want to say about this? And then I'll ask you. Uh, I, I think, I think I'm done just that. I think a lot of this is, as you pointed out, this is about her. This is about her reassuring herself that she's a good loving mother. It's about her trying to appease her guilt over murdering her kids and Tammy Daybell are participating in it. And, you know, it's, this is really about rationalization. She's trying to justify or rationalize her actions and behaviors through this delusional system that she's developed. So the question I have is uh, when I was with, uh, when I was interviewing Megan Connor, Lori Vallow Daybell's cousin right after the sentencing, and I know that you've listened to it, uh, we both speculated that we didn't see delusion disorder as much as we saw her sort of just having a deep, deep desire to negate any guilt. Thus she's going to stick to these delusions or these religious, uh, religious beliefs to make sure she never ever has to feel any shame or guilt. Um, I don't know if that means she doesn't have delusion disorder, but that's what we were speculating well, that we quickly said, but we'll let Dr. John take that one away. So <laughs> there's our question think of, for you. Think of, think of an elaborate delusional system as essentially um, a very comprehensive system of defense that's geared towards self-protection. So this defense mechanisms are really about protecting the self from failure, from inadequacies, from mis right. It, it's so, Think of defense mechanisms as self-protection. I think delusions are similar. 
delusions are probably an even think of them as defense mechanisms taken to an extreme. So delusional disorder is essentially a very elaborate and comprehensive system of defense that's r completely geared towards protecting herself and how she sees herself and feels about herself and perceives herself. That that does help me make sense of it. In other words, um, that is what the disorder might be causing, like a defense mechanism. Delusions are a defense mechanism to protect oneself. Just a, a very elaborate, you know, we all have defense mechanisms, but some of them are healthier than some defense mechanisms are healthier than others, like humor. Humor is a defense mechanism, but it turns out to be a very healthy one because it allows you to deal with reality, even if it's painful. So a delusional... A delusion is a defense. It's just a really unhealthy one because it separates you from reality. So in other words, when I uh, have dark humor or say something a little bit inappropriate, I don't have to feel too bad because at least I'm not delusional. Is that it? <laughs> not as far as I can tell. No, I think, I think humor is good. Humor is so, you know, by the way, like on that issue, if you, and, and, this is not universally true, but that it, you know, you'll notice that a lot of narcissists and a lot of people that are delusional, that they don't have a sense of humor because they can't laugh at themselves and they can't laugh at the world. They can't humor in some ways is about failure and it's about the inadequacies of the world. And it's, it's right. And that's why we laugh at it. And that's why we find things funny. And so narcissists, tend not to have a lot of good sense of humor because they can't find anything funny about themselves. They can't admit mistakes or failures and they just, they see the world as a, you know, deathly serious place uh, that they want to conquer and, or whatever that they, that they want to dominate, I think to some degree. And, and there's nothing humorous about that. Their job is to essentially, I don't know, to win, to be successful, to take things over, right? And so they don't find that humorous. Be wary of people without a sense of humor. <laughs> Just kidding, yeah. I think. <laughs> um, hmm. Interesting. Uh, Debbie is saying... Thank you, Debbie. I just wonder if Judge Boyce might have given life with the possibility of parole if she showed some remorse. I don't know. Three three consecutive lives without the possibility of parole though was pretty tense, you know. Unless um, I don't I don't know. I mean, she would have had to, I think, shown some remorse throughout the trial. He brought up one thing. Judge Boyce brought up was something John and I discussed, which is the day of the autopsy photos. She complained about being there. She was okay with everybody else, with everybody else um, seeing the photos, the jurors seeing the photos. I spoke to jurors. There are four jurors, jurors that showed up, by the way. One confided in me, and I know which one she was. She was crying during certain parts of the trial, and she told me she's now in counseling and therapy after what she heard. Um, that, that Lori was okay with everybody else, again, seeing the photos. She just didn't feel like she should have to see them because it would hurt her. Judge Boyce also brought up that when the children were missing, they weren't ever missing, but when they were missing and she didn't relay that they were dead, she didn't seem to care or have remorse that people were looking for her children, that they were worried about her children. Um, I guess going back to what Debbie's saying, I wonder if he might've given her life without the possibility of parole. She showed some remorse. She would have had to have gone back from the very beginning and showed it. Like if she showed remorse, even at that sentencing, I don't think it would have been enough. I guess that's my point. I think she would have had to sh have shown remorse uh, a year ago or two years ago or, or three years ago. It has been over four years since Charles Vallow was killed four years, no remorse. I think that it would have taken a lot more than showing remorse at the sentencing, which she didn't even come close to doing, which again, I want to go back. How do you go four years without an ounce of remorse? Is she that defended? Well, actually, so 
this brings up another issue that I was thinking about, and I, I haven't seen this talked about elsewhere very much. Maybe, maybe some law tube channels are talking about it. I'm not sure. I don't really watch a lot of law tube, but I, I think there might be, there could potentially be a strategic component here in the sense that Lori tells her, her attorneys, I want to make a statement and her attorneys say, no, no, no. Um, and then she writes a statement and they see it and they say, oh, hell yeah, read that. Right. Because th this case is going to be appealed. We know that we've heard from our sources that Lori believes she can win on appeal. And so when you think about that and you think about her statement and her statement being actually, you know, so unrepentant and so without remorse and, 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 and in a way so delusional, right? The question is, does this statement she made actually help her on appeal? Right. And so, uh, you know, wonder if there's a strategic element here, which is that she makes this statement. She lacks remorse. It shows that she's, you know, she's out there. She's delusional, right, to a large degree. And so the question becomes or can become, was she competent during this trial? Did Judge Boyce make a, fundamentally make a mistake about allowing this trial to go forward because Lori was never really competent? She was always completely crazy. And, you know, the, the answer to that has to be that there were experts brought in who demonstrated her competence. However, maybe this statement throws the ball back in the other court. And, you know, I think of somebody like Andrea Yates. Actually, so Andrea Yates was convicted of murder, like Lori, for murdering her children from postpartum depression. And then that was reversed on appeal that she was found to be legally insane. And so rather than being in prison, she was put in a mental hospital or mental institution. And so I wonder, I have to really wonder if part of this is strategy and whether a statement like this can really potentially overturn something on appeal. And I, I, I think that Judge Boyce was extremely thorough and meticulous, so I, I don't think that's going to happen. However, however, I, you know, it's really important to step back and assess the nature of a statement like this and what it does to her competence, what it does on appeal. I, I don't know. It, it does raise a lot of questions. And certainly this is a case where there's been issues around competency from the start. And I think potentially, once again, here you have it. Here you have that you're throwing into question that issue all over again here. Well, according to John Thomas, if we just love Lori, we solve everything. <laughs> right. Yeah. If we just um, love Lori and give her hope and um, all is yeah. well in the world. That's all it'll take. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to say respectfully, I think his statement was his, his, his statement was fine. It was, it was well intended, but I mean, to this idea that we're going to sit around and uh, sit, sit around a campfire and sing Kumbaya with Lori there because Lori's the martyr that's going to unite the world is, is somewhat debatable. Right. Right. Uh, glad judge boy saw through that one. <laughs> I don't think it took much. It didn't take much to see through it. Right. Yes. Um, I, I'm sure that Lori appreciated it. I'm sure she was like, exactly, everybody. <laughs> right. What he said, what right. Brother Thomas said. Yeah. Um, right, right. Um, Judge Boyce, I thought, did a great job. He said, you know, he, he didn't mention the religious rabbit hole that she's gone down that uh, she hasn't seemed to come back from. I appreciated him referring to her delusions as such a religious rabbit hole. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with them. I, you know, I think she started going that rap down that rabbit hole as a child and she keep, you know, I think the hole kept getting deeper and deeper and she never found her way out. So I, I think that's, that's an interesting component of this case. We've talked about a lot, but Certainly, you have to you have to look at some of her origins and her family and her family's belief systems, her family's focus on uh, apocalyptic endings, 
her family's focus on um, Mormonism or maybe an extreme brand of Mormonism. Uh, and so that's, that's all part of this story too, for sure. Yes. And I do know that um, the Cox family did value uh, near death experience books. It wasn't just Lori. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it, it takes me back to what she said in that testimony uh, and what we discussed a lot about that this idea that she's either going to attend the temple or uh, kill Joe Ryan. Remember that? She's either yeah. going to right. do one or right. the other. That's how Lori thinks. She's either going to be, and it's like she knows that about herself. I'm either going to be really, really, really religious, or you know, as she states on the Wheel of Fortune, you know that she's a she's a what did she say she was a a bomb waiting to happen or something. Um, it's like one or the other. Right, it's ticking like time knows. bomb. A ticking time bomb. I mean, she, do you think, I think there's a bit of that, that elsewhere? Well, she said it. The video is actually maybe it might be from the pageant or Wheel of Fortune, but it's it's an interview she does. She was, I'm a ticking time bomb. You know, I'm a, I'm an amazing mother. I'm an amazing wife, and pretty much I'm a ticking time bomb. But you know, either she's going to go to the temple and be really, really religious, or she might become a murderer. Is this again a defense mechanism? Like she either realizes she's a murderer or she's religious. Is it the same thing? Like, uh, you know. Defending herself, well, protecting herself. Does she know what she is? I think it's 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 she sees a lot of choices as being binary. She sees a lot of choices as really simple. Either it's one thing or another, and those things happen to be extreme. So uh, I think that's part of the problem here. You can see why someone like this would eventually resort to murder because she can't deal with comp she can't deal with complexity. She can't deal with contradiction. She can't deal with ambiguity. Right, like. I think that's all, yeah, that's all part of the story is that choices for her are binary, they're simplistic, they're reductive, and there's just no complexity in her world. And that, by the way, is part of a delusional belief system too. Part of delusion is trying to reduce to the world, you know, to reduce to the world to its absolute fundamental essential components. That's what ideology does. So, you know, some people would argue that ideology is a version of delusion. Don't get me started on that one. <laughs> uh, I have two more questions for you. Well, one question and then one's an inside story you and I have that we'll share that takes us back to the trial, something we were told to happen behind the scenes. But um, first off, uh, Judge Boyce, uh, when he was uh, stipulating, when he was sharing all the stipulations, he mentioned that the defense shares with him that Lori Vallow is really intelligent. And so he has no reason to not believe that. Um, that one confused me a little bit. When you talk about her not understanding complexity and all these things, do, do you feel she's intelligent? I, uh, you know, <laughs> she can certainly manipulate people. So, I mean, there's that, you right, know, there's but different, there's different types of intelligence, I guess, you know, if, does she have some social intelligence? Yeah, probably. I mean, in the sense that she knows how, right, as you point out, she knows how to manipulate people to get what she wants. You know, it, there's cognitive intelligence or intellectual intelligence. I, that would be measured by psychologists in a different manner. In terms of that, I have no idea. I wouldn't want to speculate on that. But uh, is she manipulative and does she know how to use people? Yeah, for sure. I want to end with a story, uh, an inside uh, behind the scenes story that happened during her trial. Um, many people know, know a bit of this story that um, she was not happy during the closing statements when Jim Archibald referred to Chad and his silly books and Chad uh, perhaps leading, taking the lead. He, he was, how about let's say this, Jim Archibald the very last day of closing arguments threw Chad Daybell under the bus, her husband, her lover, her, uh, whatever he is, you know, uh, the man guru. who guru, the man who buried her children in his yard. Um, she was very 
angry that that happened. And I think we soon started to learn why uh, he had not done that until closing statements, you know, try to blame Chad and his storm. He said the, the real issue was the storm. Jim Archibald concluded. Uh, but, but Lori behind the scenes, actually we've heard was upset that she thought that um, Archibald was calling her stupid or her dumb, that that was her complaint. That was what she was so upset about. Um, hearing that story was really interesting to me um, because Ch Jim Archibald did kind of call out Chad for being dumb, but he never said anything about Lori's intelligence. In fact, they, they allegedly told jo Judge Boyce she was smart. Um, any thoughts on that? I, I think it, it, it's a version of everything we talked about. I think it shows a, a lot of narcissism, obviously, right? That she's most concerned about how people will perceive her. And I mean, it's, so it's, it's everything we've talked about in this statement that her impression management and her self-image are paramount, that she's first and foremost concerned about herself. She's attention seeking. She, you know, the irony is she, I, she wants people to love her. She wants to be loved. Right. And, but the things she's doing are the very opposite of that. You know, it, it, that there's, there's certainly an element here of sabotage in the sense that everything she does undermines her goal or, or much of what she does undermines her goal. And so she, she simply can't, I mean, the ways in which she perceives that she's going to get love are not the way she's going to get it. You're, I think your mic's off. Correct. No, even with Chad, you know, people say, why Chad? Why Chad Daybell, you know, in the look wise, you know, and right. Uh, the best part was when Colby, Colby referred to him as, uh, I just forgot his name, the, man, the, the main guy on Family Guy. Colby during the jailhouse call refers to him as what's his name guys help me out here. Um, said, Oh, you just went off to Idaho with the family guy. And, uh, Jim Archibald says, just compare Chad to Charles, you know, obviously he was a better looking one, but, uh, so people wonder what did Lori see in Chad? And you point out she felt loved by him. It was a feeling like she wants love Peter Griffin. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Colby said, Oh, you're just going to go all take off to an Idaho with Peter Griffin. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it was a good moment yeah. during the trial. I was like, go Colby go. And, uh, you know, Jim Archibald said something similar, but not as, you know, straightforward. And it, but it's, she wants to be loved. Chad made her feel loved. And she started this statement in court. I want to say by saying Jesus loves me. That's how she started the statement in court. Like this is about Jesus being loved. This is about Jesus loving her. She is love. So I just want to point out that you're right. What she's always wanted. And, and we've brought that up in her testimony too. She says, I have felt the love of Jesus. It's unlike a love of anything else. And it is not of this world. We have played that quote so many times from Lori Vallow Daybell. The love of Jesus is not of this world. It is unlike anything I have felt. Chad made her feel loved. And she told everyone at the trial that Jesus loves her. She does. She wants love more than anything. And, and yeah, and she's more, she's more opposite. comfortable. She's more comfortable in fantasy than she is in reality. And again, that's part of delusion too. She has this fictitious version of love, this fantastic notion of love, which no human being could realize. Yes. And hence, hence how many marriages now? <laughs> five. Five, yeah. Well, hence five marriages, right? Like she can't. And can't the first really one when she was young, the first one when she was in high school and 18 and clearly looking for love, you know, running off with, with someone in high school.
very brief marriage. She's looking for love. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to say, John, there are a couple of people I want to thank, but, but, and share something, but anything else you want to say before I do that? Yeah, or? No, I, I do. Yeah. The, the, one of the most, I have, so one of the most interesting parts of her statement is peculiar and I haven't talked about it. And I'll, I just want to bring it up quickly here, but she mentions repeatedly the, the most often used word in her statement is busy. So I don't know. I don't know if people picked up on that, but she talks about how JJ and Tylee and Tammy constantly, how they're always busy. So she says, of JJ, he's busy. He's engaged. Of Tammy, she was extremely busy. There's this whole thing about being busy, and um, I, I thought that was really fascinating because this is coming from someone who's going to be in prison the rest of her life, right? And the antithesis of being busy is being in prison, and. Um, but I, but I, I yeah, good luck with that, Lori. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I reflected on that. And I, I think the, the point she's making is that by being busy, that somehow you are actively engaged with the world. You're, you have a sense of purpose that by busy, by being busy, you have some goals and purpose and you're engaged with life. And, you know, Lori is one of Lori's roles in these crimes was that Lori is very action oriented. I think that Lori is the one who kind of incites Chad to take action. So Lori, you know, Lori's the busy body here. She's the busy one. She's the one who wants to bring things to life. And the irony that she married a very lazy man too. <laughs> Chad yeah. is known to be lazy. Yeah. But, but she was the action oriented one. So it didn't matter. You know, he, he, she, you know, got him to work out, to take action and, and become, unfortunately for everyone busy. Yeah. And so, you know, when I, when I thought about this idea of being busy and how important it is to Lori, I, I actually thought about a play that I've been kind of obsessed with since college, which is Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. And the metaphor in Waiting for Godot is waiting. It's about, it's the opposite of being busy. It's that essentially, the, you know, one of the fundamental ideas in Godot is that time passes and we all have to fill that time in our own way. It's going to be different for everyone. Um, and so, I, you know, it occurred to me that this whole notion of being busy in some ways is very much the antithesis of Beckett's play in the sense that, you know, waiting is about embracing complexity and it's embracing um, contradiction and, and many of the things we talked about earlier. And those are things that, that Laurie struggles with. And so, you know, I, I couldn't help reflect that, um, you know, in, in 1957, there was a production of Waiting for Godot that was that was performed at San Quentin Prison outside of San Francisco for a bunch of inmates. And it was a huge hit. The inmates loved it. And one of the things they said was that prison is all about waiting. It's all about waiting for release, hearings, meals, whatever. Like, nobody's busy in prison, right? And I, I thought about that, and I thought uh, thought about the irony that that here's someone, Lori Daybell, who's obsessed with acting and being busy and occupying the time with all this frivolous, all these frivolous delusions and creating this fictitious world that doesn't exist and trying to live in it. And now here she's going to be in this really small prison cell for the rest of her life, essentially waiting for an apocalypse to occur that's never going to arrive. Right. Like everything that this this woman wanted has essentially been undermined. Everything that she valued has now been reduced to ashes, like this whole notion of being busy. Right. Like it, it's and, and yet here she is in her statement. Still focusing on the very things she can't have. Right. The very things that that she values that are now no longer a part of her life. And so I, I thought of the irony of that. And kind of the, I don't know, if there's any hope here, 
maybe it's that she'll learn from this that you know waiting and not being so busy might really you know might lead to some self reflection which might lead to some change and maybe maybe a hope against hope maybe john thomas is right you know maybe maybe the hope here is that she can change and eventually get to a place of some remorse i don't know but so those were kind of my final thoughts Thanks. I want to point out that Troublemaker Baker, our wonderful moderator, who I'm going to talk about a little bit more soon, um, she, she mentioned, put your shoulder to the wheel. Well, that was what was played at Tammy's funeral. Yeah. Tammy is busy and working in heaven, according to her funeral and according to Chad, who wanted his wife, even in life, to remain busy. I have um, additional information from visiting Rexburg. I, I knocked on the door of of a neighbor uh during my p visiting of the pings and they invited me in and i learned that this woman who told me i could tell this story uh visited tammy for five years it was her visiting teacher for five she was tammy's visiting teacher that's an L uh church of jesus christ latter-day saints that's a term that was once used uh to mean that you you check on your neighbor uh you're in charge of different different people in your ward in your congregation that you, you check on and you visit them at least once a month. So this woman checked on Tammy for five years, every month. And she said that when she left her husband, when she was visiting Tammy, her husband knew that she would be right home, that a visit with Tammy was never more than 15 minutes tops because Tammy uh, would enjoy talking with her, but then Chad would come into the doorway and give Tammy the side eye <laughs> and imply that it was time to end your little visit, Tammy. And at that moment, the woman saw Chad and would look at Tammy and Tammy would say, well, let's kind of, let's done. She said that Tammy was always so kind and always so generous. Uh, and, and, but it was Chad, Chad would walk into that doorway and put an end to the visit. And that was it. We also know that Chad would say, stop playing your video games. Tammy, be busy. Go work on genealogy. Go do family history. And then for him to sing, to sing, uh, put your shoulder to the wheel at the funeral of his wife, that she remains busy. And Lori is now saying that her eternal friend is busy. So I'm, I'm going to put something out into the world for, for Tammy Daybell. Uh, and I, uh, a friend of the program, Lynette, also mentioned this in a Facebook post. On the Facebook page, we really love this Facebook group, True Crime Underground, Lori Daybell, Cult Mom. Everyone go join it. But but uh, Lynette wrote, my wish for Tammy is that she is riding her bicycle brawless in heaven, singing at the top of her lungs, and finally relaxing, finally <laughs> taking a break, and not doing genealogy. And I wish the same thing for Tammy Daybell, um, uh, you know, who was not my friend, but I wish she could have been. I, I love her family. Her sister, Samantha, and her, her aunt Vicky did so well with their victim impact statements, but that is what I hope for Tammy Daybell in heaven. Um, back to Troublemaker Baker. She is staying busy. Our wonderful moderator, Troublemaker Baker, has started her own YouTube channel. Um, and she is a baker and she is uh, celebrating August or August with an egg video every, every day. So if you want to go support Troublemaker uh, and keep her busy, <laughs> you can head over to her YouTube channel. I don't know if being busy is a good thing or a bad thing tonight. Sometimes we like being busy, sometimes we don't. But it is my hope that Tammy ba Daybell finally takes some time off and I um, hope that uh, Lori Dable doesn't know what to do with herself. You're right, in her little teeny tiny cell. Uh, she's going to find it very hard to stay busy. So thank you for those thoughts on being busy, John. And, and yeah, I, right, right. The, the, I guess part of my point, too, is that being busy can be a virtue, but so can waiting, so can being patient and Sometimes we can control our time and sometimes we can't. And that's just fine. Correct. 
And Lori's not going to be able to control it. No, right. Finally, no. Hopefully, Tammy will be in control of her time. So, yes. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. And uh, please give this video a like. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Those two things help us so much. And I have a little guy here, by the way, if everybody's wondering who I've been talking to on the side here that really wants us to wrap it up. And uh, <laughs> he's not busy right now. He's bored. So we're going to go. He's here. waiting. He's clearly waiting. Yes. So thank you, everyone. And uh, we will see you next week. And uh, sign up also, at hit notifications, because I do do surprise lives. That's well known. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. All right. Good night. Thanks, guys. Good night.